Hi everyone, welcome back to Rationable and either you're listening to this on the Rationable podcast or the Rationable YouTube channel. Either way, welcome. This is going to be a very, very special conversation that I've been having with Richard Saunders from the Skeptic Zone podcast in Australia. He has been very helpful. He's put up promos for uh, Rationable on his channel and he does a lot of amazing work in promoting skepticism and in supporting skeptics across the world through his podcast. So uh, welcome, Richard. Finally have you on the show. I'm so grateful that you're here. Hello. Hello. It's, <laughs> it's good to be here. It's good. To start with, what were you like before you became a skeptic? What, what were your belief <laughs> systems? What did you... Well, before I became a skeptic, I was firmly convinced that uh, aliens were visiting the Earth and that ah. the Loch Ness Monster was real and Bigfoot was running around in the United States. <laughs> now, this is coming from growing up in the 1970s, mm. where this sort of thing was incredibly popular. Uh, we just had Yuri Geller in the early 70s bending spoons. Mm -hmm. And then it just took off, and it was very popular in the news and in the media, mysteries, that sort of thing. And as a kid, it just seemed true. And maybe I wanted it to be true. It was fantastic. It was interesting. So you I wanted really to believe. believe. I wanted to believe. Well, I did believe. <laughs> That's the thing. And I just accepted it as fact that uh, UFOs were really alien spaceships, because that's mm -hmm. what a lot of people think when they think the word UFO, they really thinking alien spaceship. And I would, I remember when I was 12 or something like that, I, I actually made up a form and I had people fill it out. Have you seen a UFO? Yes. What angle of the sky was it? Where were you when you saw this UFO? Wow. It was great. Um, <laughs> and probably because of movies like Close Encounters of the Third Kind and stuff like yeah. that. Star Wars, you know. So, and then it got a bit muddy after a while. I, I you know, you can't, you, you can't keep hanging onto these things forever. So, through my later school life and everything else, I guess these things were in the background, but sort of pushed aside a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't until, oh, I must have been in my twenties that I, I went to a talk by Robert Schaefer, well-known UFO expert here in Sydney, a skeptic, and. He just made so much sense. He said, you know, if UFO, if, if UFOs or alien spaceships after all these years would have something more than people saying it or videos that, what's that video? Well, I'm not sure. It's a bit of a funny video. And then after much thought, things like uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos came along. Yeah, which that, actually, actually, that was before. That, that was, was before. Carl yeah. Sagan's Cosmos, I think, was one of the first places where I actually saw aliens being discussed. And of course, I was like seven years old then. Yeah. So it was like, oh, aliens are true. Okay, fine. And just walk away from that. Yeah. It took a long time though. And then, of course, the X Files came along and I was hooked yeah. and I yeah. was all in and I was a full sci fi geek. So I totally understand that journey. Like, I was there too. <laughs> but, so, what snapped yeah, some you out of the things. Well, nothing snapped me out of it. It, it was just a sort of a, a progression. There wasn't one day where I thought my, my, my brain just flicked, but it was an easy progression because it just made so much sense. And now what I do, if I'm talking about UFOs, well, they, they ask me, do I think there are aliens out there in space? My, well, the, to that I say most probably. Why? Well, why not? Sure. Absolutely. Are they visiting the Earth then? I use some very good um, logic, but you have to know something about the history of the universe and the size of the galaxy mm. and, and light years and everything. And it's quite simple. You just say that the stars are very far away, very, very far away. The, you know, it would take thousands of years to get anywhere. Even if you could travel at the speed of light, it would still take you four years to get to our nearest neighbor. And you have to assume that if aliens are visiting us, then a civilization has grown up somewhere in our galaxy, not too far away, really. And they're only a few hundred years advanced than us. You know, the odds of all those things happening and that they'd actually detect us somehow, given that our radio transmissions are going out in a bubble at the speed of light from our planet. They haven't really encountered that many stars yet. 
And we'd have to have one of those stars with a, an intelligent life a bit more advanced than ours able to travel here. And you, you, all these things start to stack up and you think, it's just extremely unlikely. And then yeah, with the age absolutely. of the universe, you could say it's possible that an incredible space uh, faring species started, flourished, built empires, and disappeared four billion years ago. Or in three more billion years, something will happen and there'll be a new species come along. So you're looking at not only huge and unimaginable gaps between the stars, the distances you have to go, but the gaps in time. Absolutely. Time. Who knows? Billions of years ago, there could have been an, an incredible civilization, all gone. So it, there's yeah. a lot of mystery still. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And being able to face the challenges that come with, even if you assume that they have managed to get to a speed of, you know, which is close to the speed of light to mm. enable their travel, it still takes them literally astronomical number, <laughs> numbers of years yeah, yeah, to get yeah. anywhere. You have to, I mean, it, there's a lot of not only physical endurance, but a lot of technological advances you have to make to be able to cope with the increase in density as you approach the speed of light. I, I mean, will alien species, will extraterrestrials even bother to take that kind of trouble to get there? Or would they be just well, like, like, I think Michio Kaku was one of the people who discussed this uh, to an extent that ideally, most probably, in the steps that we are probably going to take next to explore other star systems, other aliens could be sending maybe bug-sized spaceships, not full flying saucers, maybe. Yeah, yeah, or they did billions of years ago or thousands of years ago, or they yet to do it. Uh, again, I, and a lot of people don't even consider this. So a lot of people will not consider the fact that the, the age of the universe and civilizations or species or evolution would happen at different time periods and different planets. And there could be a great civilization right now, 20,000 light years from us. Yeah. There's, there's, no, there's no prospect of us making any meaningful contact or any contact with them at all. And then people will say, well, of course, you're being so um, parochial, you know, what you what what if these aliens invented uh, wormhole technology and they could what, what if what if what if what if what exactly if? Or, there's a lot fine. that's there's a lot of what ifs and assumptions that go into that and recently there's, there's actually, a lot of what ifs yeah that recently uh, on the rational conversations group i mean i put up a post about the tic tac ufo sighting which is about right. recently yep. been declassified and there's been yeah. a lot of discussion that's been happening on that but all that can be provided, the only evidence can be provided, is people who were there who saw some blips on the radar or saw their, you know, infrared camera, you know, recordings and heard something. But they're remembering, they're thinking of an incident that happened like a decade and a half back and have only has only now come to light. And yeah. relying on their memory as a form of evidence, I find to be really troublesome i mean we can barely remember what we did last week i mean at least at my age <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't <laughs> uh, well, but it's it's interesting I, I do like looking at those videos and i'm glad somebody was able to deconstruct that properly and i don't pretend to be an expert when it comes to the fine art of doing things like that i mean you have to leave it to people who really know what they're talking about well, but one of the the funniest ones and it's baffling to me about this whole UFO thing has been the recent in the last 30 years uh, phenomenon of crop circles. Mm -hmm. Now, people, I've met people who are so uh, convinced that these are messages from aliens. It's staggering. And when you learn how to do it, it's not difficult and people do it for jokes and people do it for artistic reasons. They're not doing it much now because of COVID. They didn't do it much during foot and mouth outbreaks. But it's so <laughs> blindingly simple to, to, to see that people do it. People make crop circles for whatever reason. It's well within our uh, skill set to do it. Humans are very clever. But some people cannot accept, just cannot or will not accept that they are just pranksters or artists or just people out for a good time 
And uh, after all these years, I must admit, you don't hear much about crop circles anymore. They're sort of, they've had their day, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, we still talk about uh, the Nazca lines and, mm. you know, things that Eric von Daniken talked about. Like I had, I, I was recently in a conversation with, um, on another podcast called The Decast, which you should definitely check out when you get the time. Mm-hmm. I was talking about the episode that Brian Dunning did, which was about Eric von Daniken and his Chariots of the Gods books, which is something that I used to listen to. Um, I mean, I haven't read, but I've kind of flipped through when I was a kid. My mm-hmm. brother had read it and we'd had a lot of conversations around it, which were very interesting on the whole. And for a long time, I kind of believed that, you know, there might be something there. And it took me a long time to actually look into it and start thinking about it and looking for evidence that this might be true and that the, you know, that the pyramids were built by aliens and that we had ancient technology, et cetera, et cetera. I kind of dismantled it by myself. I'm like, you know, humans, there weren't any stupider back then than we are now. (laughs) Like, yeah, we're pretty stupid as a race, but we have achieved some amazing (laughs) things and built skyscrapers and space stations and, you know, sense, you know, probes to Mars and Venus and almost Mm. every planet in the solar system. So we are pretty ingenious when it comes to certain things. So why wouldn't we, given less technology and fewer tools, but with the same sense of ingenuity, have built some amazing things like drawn out the Nazca lines or built the pyramids? It's, I mean, it's, I, I think that we give ourselves too little credit and try and give all the credit to the aliens who probably haven't visited us at all so <laughs> yeah and and it's important to remember that the people who built the pyramids and, and the nazca lines and some, and some of the ancient wonders were extremely motivated for religious yeah. reasons or spiritual reasons or they had to please the king or whatever the case may be and uh, again you, you you're absolutely right they were people just like us they were homo Absolutely. sapiens. They had the same smarts as we do. And you'd be surprised at what you can do, what people can invent, given the right motivation. So, yeah, of course. And they had the time. You know, the pyramids didn't happen overnight. They had a long time to build the pyramids. Yes, so, absolutely. I mean, all these things make sense. And all these things people can do. You don't have to then, it's, you know, you invoke uh, Occam's Ray. You don't have to assume all sorts of other things are true before you you have you have to explain the pyramids. You all you have to explain, or you have to acknowledge, is that humans are very smart and they had the motivation. Absolutely, and I love Occam's razor. That's um, that is the argument that you know taken two assumptions, two claims. The one which has the need for the fewest number of assumptions is probably the right yeah. one. Am I on in the ballpark there? Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, I've heard it described so many different ways, but more or less, the, 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 if you've got two competing theories, the one that uses the, the least number of new assumptions. New assumptions. And, you know, yeah, if you can explain something, if you can explain something or, or unproven assumptions, someone will, someone will correct us. But if you can explain something uh, in an in a easy fashion as opposed to unnecessarily complicated one, then the mm-hmm. easier solution is probably the one you should favor. Of course, there mm-hmm. are exceptions to those, but uh, that's more or less yeah. it, yeah. But is this uh, <laughs> the aliens and uh, these kinds of claims, are these some of your pet peeves as a skeptic, or is there something else that you are just riles you up every time? Oh, talking talking to the dead, I think, is my number one pet peeve. Ah. Uh, Yes. Aliens are fun. I mean, I'm, I've met some interesting people over the years who believe in aliens and UFOs, and yeah, well, okay. But the, the people who talk to the dead come in two broad categories. One is people who are so deluded. They think they're getting messages and vibrations from spirits or angels or fairies or pixel, pixie, pixels, pixies, <laughs> something like that. Uh, and the other brand, which are the people who know full well, Mm-hmm. They're not getting messages, but they'll still play the part. And, you know, after a lot of study and looking at these people, you can tell, you can pick the difference between the people who who 
know that they're um, just conning people and lying, basically, and the people who are sincerely self-deluded. Mostly you can tell. Sometimes you still can't. It's mm. really, really tricky. I was just about to say, I always have to remind myself that people are capable of deluding themselves incredibly and believing all sorts of things they talk themselves into or they start to think this is reality or whatever it is. So that in that respect, sometimes I've come across people who say they can talk to the dead and I think, oh, they, they know that they're not talking to the dead or they're not, you know, they know they're not getting magical messages. And I think, well, maybe they do. Maybe they really are deluded. It's hard to tell sometimes. Yeah, and some people just like to believe that there is something else out there, something that they can't completely understand or grasp. Maybe there's a you know another power or the spirits of ancestors or other people or angels yeah. that have been you know wandering around, and that there are certain people who can genuinely pick up those vibrations and actually communicate with them. So I think it's I think it might be a compl combination of a lot of things, the people who really want to believe and feel that this world, sure. this reality is just not enough to explain everything, at least from their perspective. I was just about to say, it, it it's also taps into one of the, the greatest things that, that uh, humans have, and that is our curiosity. Yeah. It really does cap into our curiosity. And we evolved curiosity to help us survive. But that curiosity can then say, well, I'm curious about maybe this person can talk to the dead. But it's a double-edged sword because you can easily be tricked, led astray. Uh, and it's people like you and me who make a study of this can actually pick apart the the, the trick or the methodology or whatever it is. But mm -hmm. um, people are naturally curious. They want to know, is that a ghost? You know, I want to know. I want to know. It's interesting. Absolutely. And it's it's a uh, it's something that I think I mean one of the reasons I guess that you do have Susan Gerbic on uh, so often on your show and she is she really is fantastic. I had a recently I had a live conversation with her um and she, unfortunately uh psychics and and ghosts and spirits is something that I have never dealt with, you know, I mean it's not something that has personally affected me. Yeah, but you know so that's why i i am more focused on things like alternative medicine and uh, you know things to do with health and everyday decisions that people make which is why that's a majority of the content that goes on to rationable but uh, this is i mean but i find the entire field really really intriguing and love the work that susan has been doing as well and you i i saw this <laughs> well this is i mean it's a bit of a deviation but i did ju recently watch a video of you on uh, australian television talking with an astrologer yeah. can you tell me a little bit more about how that <laughs> came together that probably is milton black and that was about whew, maybe 10 years ago it's hard to remember and i did something which i thought would work I notice when people are on, are on TV being interviewed or whatever, it suddenly gives them a lot of credibility if they have a sheet of paper and it looks like they're reading something official. So I, yeah. <laughs> I had that. And to tell everybody what happened, I went on to, well, it's a TV debate. It was only five minutes. You can't get very far anyway. And I thought to myself, this guy is an astrologer and a famous Australian astrologer. I'm going to set a trap for him. Now, according to what you'd read in the newspaper, my birthday is um, in the star sign of Sagittarius. But as the pr procession of the, the equinox, uh, the planets move, the stars move, to cut a long story short, if we were to use that system, I'm really a Scorpio. Not many people know that. It's a bit of silly fun. So when we're mm. on the show, I said to him, now, uh, Milton, I was born on the 28th of November. That would make me, uh, uh, and I sort of hesitated. I knew he'd jump in. I knew he'd jump in. He'd say, oh, uh, Sagittarius. No, I said, and I held up the paper, <laughs> showed him <laughs> the printout of where the sun was. And I said, how could you get it so wrong? It, it was a trap. You know, it was a trap. But um, That was genius, though. I, I was like, how did he get that paper out there? <laughs> he knew. You predicted exactly what he was going to go for. I, I, 
Well, yeah, I, I knew he, I knew he, he couldn't help because being an astrologer, he would automatically know if I gave him a date, he'd know what the star sign was because that's that's his business. So that yeah, was a bit exactly. of fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic, though. And he, in the middle of it, I, I linked the I linked the uh, the video in the description, and maybe in the podcast I'll put the audio in. It's it's really fun to watch or and even <laughs> listen to. Uh, but in the middle, I think did he try and cop out and just say that? Oh, uh, I've got the sh- the date and the time of birth of such and such some other person. I think you'd mentioned uh, another yeah, skeptic from someone else who wasn't present that day. Not sure. I, I'll give him a little bit of levity here. I think he got some wrong information from a producer or something. I found it a little bit confusing too. I'm mm-hmm. not sure exactly what he was doing. But when that confusion was sort of settled down a little bit, he then just gave me a standard uh, Barnum statement. He just, just <laughs> could apply to, to many people. What exactly is a Barnum uh, and statement? And the next though? thing I had, a Barnum statement it comes from the circus manager, uh, P.T. Barnum. It's something mm-hmm. to please everyone. It's something used in cold reading. It's, a, it's, it's more or less, uh, if I was to say to your audience, now I'm, I'm reading your mind, now I'm getting vibrations. You're generally an optimistic person, but sometimes you have self-doubts. You like to be the life of the party, but you know sometimes you need to hide yourself away. You recently had a uh, disappointment. Yeah, these are Barnum's. Oh, statements. this is so me. And people, oh yeah, <laughs> this is so me. This is just like me. And he 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 began to do that more or less to me. And I had another sheet of paper that that explained Barnum's. I didn't get time to show it, but I. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, you can do it now. And uh, because I was, I'm sure the audience can do would it love now. to know. <laughs> um, well, well, cold reading is a, a whole art unto itself. It's it's just amazing. And I like to, well, when I have time, I, I can uh, unpack psychic readings and, you know, point mm. out exactly what's happening. That does take a long time, though. I'm sure it does. But then I was going to challenge him to take the test, you know, to test him, but nothing mm. ever eventuated. <laughs> well, I, you know, hopefully somebody will take you up on that. I'm sure somebody will be, you know, but they'll be cautious because they know James Randi has been trying to do that for a very long time and yeah. nobody's really managed to pass his tests, which is quite ingenious. Maybe you should start something like that in Australia. Yeah. Is there something like that in Australia? Oh, there has been for 40 years. Oh Ooh, my goodness great. me, the Australian Skeptics $100,000 challenge. And we and I was part of the James Randi Educational Foundation's $1 million mm-hmm. challenge for some years. And it's the same story in the United States when I was there doing the challenge as it is here. Most people won't apply. And if they do apply, they don't know how to answer the three basic questions. The three basic okay. questions for applying mm-hmm. for our tests before we even start, before we negotiations start, we need to know three basic questions. One is, what exactly is your paranormal or supernatural claim? You'd be surprised how many people can't actually articulate, write that down. Two, the, the second part is, uh, under what circumstances can you perform your claim? You have to be well fed is it on a tuesday do you have to have three hours of meditation you know what 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 conditions and mm-hmm. three how successful do you expect to be 20 percent successful 90 percent. when we know all those three we can then begin to construct a test most people cannot answer those three questions oh seriously like right off the bat the first seriously. step in and they right off flunk the bat. out so, well, what's your claim? Uh, well, I'm sort of, I get, I get feelings and I think I can do, you know. <laughs> okay. And under what conditions? Most people, actually, if they get to the second part, most people say, oh, anytime. I can do it anytime, anywhere. All right. How successful are you? Then people start to not really, they're not really sure. But a lot of people simply won't even apply, you know, famous so psychics have- or, or whatever. Wow. And is, has there been something, uh, maybe a case that has been particularly interesting 
that I mean, one of the people who've who've come in and given this a shot. Can you give us a one of the stories that came through? Yeah, it. In my experience, okay, most people I've personally been involved with in Australia have been water diviners, water dowsers, people who can go along with sticks and walk around yeah. and find hidden underground water. And we have held big tests with water diviners, and I've put a couple up on YouTube, which I've filmed myself. And they're an interesting crowd because almost universally, when we say, how successful are you? They will say 100%. I never miss. That's an interesting one. That's interesting. And so we've had some really interesting times. I once was involved with a test of somebody who said they spoke to spirits, but didn't go very far because she tried to give us three of us a reading from the spirits and it, it just fell flat. You know, the spirits weren't <laughs> communicating very well that day. <laughs> the thing about water divining, I think in India, I haven't looked too deeply into it, but with the people I've spoken to, a lot of people take it for granted that it works, that it is a fact. In fact, mm-hmm. a lot of people hire water diviners to find places to put down tube wells and it's and they seem to be i mean of course the water table is quite vast so there is a very high possibility that wherever you kind of drill down you probably find water somewhere uh it's been depleted yeah. quite you know quite extremely especially in the cities but yeah people still take it for granted i think that that is that is a completely legitimate technique to find water underground. It, it's, it boggles Same my mind. It... A lot of people simply assume it's real. And a lot of people assume that there are special people out there who either have a, a natural gift or have learned a special skill. Uh, yeah. I would have to say most people, if they think about it, most people have no idea that it doesn't work. In fact, the uh, another yeah. thing that which you had done on television, which I just I watched the video last night, and... I didn't know you were, a, you know, you were the first domino that kind of set the ball rolling in this in this thing. Is the power balance bands? Now those are something yeah, that. Yeah, I think I've got one. Somewhere. Really? All right, there we go. So cool. I actually, I had a friend who uh, right, wore one of these. There we go. Look. Oh, there's the hologram. The magical hologram. Yeah. That's a good. That's good. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> well, so I, cool. I um, I I was lucky. <laughs> I, I was very lucky because I was able to do the right test to the right person at the right time on national TV, and the, the, if people don't know, the power balance bracelet was a. It's a bit of plastic and a hologram, mass produced in China. Cost about ten cents to make. They were selling it here in Australia for sixty dollars. 60 Australian dollars, which is about 50 US, something like that. And to demonstrate it, they would do a series of what we call applied kinesiology tests by putting pressure on somebody's arm and making them tip off balance and things like this. And all of these tests, you can you can fool somebody. You can you can you can do tricks to to make it look like this band was increasing their strength and their flexibility and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. I knew the tricks. The strange thing is that people can, can can fool themselves into thinking they're um, doing proper tests when, when they don't even realize they're pushing in different directions. It's a bit complicated. Nevertheless, so all I did was I on TV is I put the guy selling them here in Australia to a proper scientific test, double-blind random test. That's all I did. The simplest possible scientific test which showed that the device simply had no power to change people's strength and balance and all the rest of it. And then, yeah, that started the the ball rolling. Yeah. Wow. That is because I, uh, I first encountered it when a colleague of mine and, a, and now a friend who was wearing it at, uh, at my office and I asked about it and they said, well, you know, a lot of sports people are wearing it apparently. Uh, and he, he rattled off a few names And it's supposed to improve your balance and strength and agility. And I was like, that piece of plastic is supposed (laughs) to do all of that. Like there are, 
I mean, there are sports people who train for decades to <laughs> increase their strength, balance, and stability. And this is supposed to just do it like that. Well, he's like, well, it's not that much. I mean, this is just a relative increase. I said, so is it working for you? He's <laughs> like, I think it is. I said, all right. So then I, I just, I said, can I have a closer look at it? So I just, I had a closer look at it. And it was basically, it was one of those cheap holographic stickers, which you can yeah. pretty much find anywhere on just a plastic band. And there it is. That's all it is. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it's incredible. Like, so that, that was, um, I was a budding skeptic at the time. It had just been a couple of years that I'd kind of started my journey and this just failed at the plausibility level. Like I was like, how is that even yeah. supposed to work? Like I, yeah. I can't even look it up. One of the interesting things is, uh, and if you watch, you saw the video, the guy who I tested, he just regurgitated this pseudoscientific babble from the distributor from the main company in the US. And he mm -hmm. started to talk about mylar technology and human residence and frequencies and everything. <laughs> it sounds so scientific. Yeah. And I think I, on the program, I said, it just sounds like you've got a lot of scientific words and mix them together. Yeah. That goes to, and that can convince people. If you don't know basic science, or even if you do know some science, but you don't know these terms or what their meaning was, it can sound mm. plausible. Oh, it, it's it's that frequency, is it? Oh, that must mean something. And And then when you see the test being done and it appears to work, well, there you go. No wonder, no wonder they sold hundreds and thousands of yeah them. and then i looked it up right then and there and i found that uh australia had banned the production and sale of these as far as i can remember uh, they yeah the, the company had to, to print a retraction in in the national press saying all the claims we made for this weren't based you know weren't new, basically but i you know what i still see them around every now and then in a flea market or something like that so somebody's making yeah. them somewhere company went None broke of, i think <laughs> I'm glad because I, I could still see them uh, being sold in India at the time. I don't think anybody has ever published anything or, you know, even challenged that company in, in this country. So I'm sure there are people wandering around with those things on. And you know what it reminded me of? And this, uh, there was an incident which actually reminded me of the power bands, which is when Goop, Gwyneth Paltrow's uh, <laughs> wellness company, uh, when yeah. they came out with these stickers which is supposed to stick on yourself and apparently made out of some NASA space suits or some nonsense. And NASA <laughs> immediately put in a comment saying, we never built, we don't never have that kind of technology in our space suits. This is a complete lie. Please don't listen to it. <laughs> I don't know how long that product yeah, well, lasted in the markets though. If, if these bands don't come back, something will come back that uses the same tricks of showing how somebody can be uh, knocked off balance or their strength diminishes or increases those these tricks have been around for years absolutely i'm sure i've seen some indian products with those kind of things on uh, speaking of india though uh way to segue <laughs> but you did tell me that you had come to india a while yes. back so what brought you yes. here who did you meet what did you do early on when i was with the australian skeptics so in 2000 i joined in 2001 on the committee. And by 2002, I found myself on a plane going to New Delhi to take part in the, Ration, the Rationalist Conference. Yeah, And it's so long ago now, I don't remember that. I, I, I'd have to look up in my diaries to, to, to remember some of the time, the people I was dealing with and who I talked to over there. Yeah, it's just a long time ago. But anyway, <laughs> I gave fine. a talk there. Uh -huh. I, I went with a, 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 a colleague at the time and, and we had a Oh, just an incredible time in New Delhi. It was it was amazing. Uh, and then we were lucky enough to have a day or two, so we went to see the Taj Mahal like everybody does. And we went yeah. by train, which was really great. And I'll never forget, uh, we were walking around New Delhi one morning before the conference, and I saw these kids playing cricket. Now, there's a shock. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they, <laughs> they didn't have a proper bat. And I can't remember. I think they were using either a tennis ball or something. Yeah, yeah. tennis ball. And for cricket so I picked it up. In the streets. And there were only, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 year old kids. So I picked it up and I said, right, I'll bowl you a couple of, of um, slow, slow balls. So I, I started my run up 
And as I came down to deliver my bowl, I noticed there were three kids with bats ready <laughs> all at once. <laughs> Uh, that was that was a good memory, and uh, I, I, we ate well. And because um, you know, I, 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 this is no secret to people who who know me. I just love curries. I, oh man, I just <laughs> love Indian food. If I come to visit, you know where to take me <laughs> anywhere. Oh, um, absolutely. But yeah, what an experience it was. It was, so, it was it was something else, and I haven't been back to India that since. Oh, but now I guess I think now you have you probably have reason to come again. I just have to organize some sort of a conference type thing. Anybody who's in on yes, a conference yes. in Delhi, <laughs> just let me know in the comments. <laughs> but uh, oh, so, so I, and but it was it was yeah. We I met lots of interesting people. I, I really did. I, people from all around India came to this conference, and some ah. Americans and some British people. So it was quite it was quite a deal. But it, again, it's you know it's almost twenty years ago, so some of the the, the details are, uh, I can't quite quite remember. But I, I can I show you the curtains I use in my room, I bought yeah. in India at that trip, up there. There they are. Mm -hmm. Oh, lovely! Those are nice. Yeah, and I've been using them ever since. Yeah. And you I, picked them up oh, at Janpath or something like that? Oh, no, where did I pick them up? Just somewhere in New Delhi. It's just one second, one second. All right. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. We have we have some of those as well, actually. I think we got those from Agra. But I I wanted to uh, the last couple of things I wanted to talk about were first of all the Skeptic Zone podcast. Now you've how long has that been running around? Mm, it started in September. Yes, it started in sep September two thousand eight. So it's uh, twelve years now. Oh. Amazing. It started the very first time I recorded for the Skeptic Zone was at the Dragon Con convention, which is normally now happening now. I flew over there and I started the podcast. Mm -hmm. It's a weekly show. I've never missed a week since the second week, wow. I think. There could have been a gap after one episode, then there was a gap, and then every week since it's up to as we record this, it's the next show will be six hundred and twenty one. Wow. It's more or less an hour long every week, and I have segmented reports. So there'll be a report going for 10 minutes, a very quick ad break, and you're in the next episode with a quick ad break. Then another report or an interview or something, uh, and then that's that's the way the show goes. And I've got reporters here in Australia and in the United States. I mean, that must be a, it must be quite quite an ordeal to kind of get coordinated efforts from so many different directions. I mean, of course, I know I've contributed a couple of times and you just, you let me know a couple of yeah. days in advance. I get that in, but it must be, you must have like eight arms to kind of take care of everything. Yeah. Well, you see, I'm not only the host, I also do all the production. Exactly. Now, sometimes, yeah. Because the skeptic my reporters will send me, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when my reporters send me uh, one of their reports, They'll send it to me in a raw fashion, so I'll usually edit that up a little bit and just make it tight and everything. But when I come to do my own interviews, like you're doing with me now, I'll do those all for, here from the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do a lot of field work. Well, I used to before COVID, but I'd go out and interview people in person and stuff like that. And then, yeah, it's a matter of doing all the production. Uh, or the, these days, I can do it all on the iPad, which is quite incredible. But it's still, you have to mix sound. I, I do all the music on this show is I put together myself, so I don't have to worry about copyright. But yeah, it's it's mixing up the the interviews and editing those and and all the the, the the bits. And lately, I've been doing little funny routines, which take a bit of time to do. But yeah, yeah, it's it's Comedy's still hard. It's still a lot of fun. I'm sure it is. And what is it that you do uh, outside the Skeptic Zone podcast? What do you do in the, uh, the rest of your time? Well, normally, until this year, I do TV and film work. Mm -hmm. But this year has really um, been bad for that. Yeah. So I don't us. do very much at all because there's not much, yeah, pro big problems. And the other bad thing was I would also do a science show for school children called The Mystery Investigators where mm -hmm. it's a live show in front of an audience of school students. And I've been doing that with – to help from various partners for 16 years or something and that's that stopped 
so um I guess in a way I've been able to put more time into the skeptic zone. So we'll see what Absolutely. next year brings. Wonderful. And and I also heard something which is uh while I was looking you up was that you are a professional origamist. Is that how you say it? Yes. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I years ago I put out a, a DVD of how to make your own origami with a friend of mine. We did that. There's me. Oh wow! <laughs> how do you how to make that, all this? That is amazing. And I invented origami Pegasus, which is James Randi's flying pig. <laughs> that is so cute. Flying if pig. You look, if you go to YouTube and look up origami flying pig, you'll find instructions on how to make that flying. Oh, pig. that's wonderful and adorable. Yeah. So, so yes, I've uh, I've written lots of books about origami and the DVD, and I and I make jewelry. So um, I still get a, an awful lot of pleasure out of folding things and making things out of paper. And you've got books out on on you know on this topic that you can that you yeah on. yeah. Um, Although I'm so old, these books came out a long time ago. <laughs> it's, it's, I think in the '90s or something. So look at that, origami, spooky po- paper folding. Wow, that looks like so much fun. <laughs> I wonder if you can get these in India. Are they on Amazon? Spiders and bats and monsters. That's amazing. Oh no, not, not anymore. They're actually, they're, I've got some copies, but they've been out of print for some time. But that's okay. That's okay. Oh. Oh, uh, the year is for this 1990. So that's oh, quite, goodness. <laughs> quite, a, quite a long time ago. But if people want to uh, fold origami with me, if they look up my name, Richard Saunders and origami on YouTube, you'll, you'll, you'll find some stuff. Wonderful. So any origami enthusiasts out there, you know where to look if yeah. you want to get some instructions from a professional. <laughs> and... Uh, Okay, just before we wrap up, I, I, I'm very excited that the second online skeptical conference is happening, that at least that, that I know of, um, and that is Skepticon 2020. So uh, can you give us some details on that and how to get, yeah. how to get, in, get in the, into the action? Everybody around the world can at last join us for the Australian Skeptics National Convention, which has been going for, well, well over 30 years we've been having a national convention. And this year, because of COVID, like everything else, it's online. And Mm -hmm. it's on the 23rd, 24th, and 25th of October, I think it is. Skepticon.org.au. That that sounds right. You can see the I'll speakers put that, coming up. I'll put up. the link in the in the description. Put the link the in. Notes. Yeah, and we've got some, a fabulous speakers lined up, some skeptical workshops, and because it's online, the prices are very cheap. And you can also um, join us for the awarding of the Bent Spoon Award, which we give Ooh, every year, like which is to yeah, we we award this to the most preposterous piece of pseudoscientific or paranormal piffle. Every year. I hope you have a lot of nominees. That'll be f- so much fun. <laughs> There's a lot of nominees this year for COVID-19, surprisingly. I, I'm not surprised <laughs> at all. The, the, kind of, the kind of nonsense that has been coming out for the last few years. Yeah. Well, a few months, sorry. It feels like a few years, doesn't it? It feels um, like a few years, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. But I've, I've already signed up for Skepticon. I've made the, I've got the ticket. And now I just have to figure out how to stay up between 3 a.m. and 11 a.m. <laughs> so I can watch the whole thing. Uh, but, but here's the good thing. Once you bought your ticket to Skepticon, that gives you access to the videos afterwards. So if you, you can't stay up all night, don't worry. Go to bed, wake up, and then you can, you can still watch the videos. So that's, yeah. a, that's a great thing I think they're doing this year. Well, if I ma- if I somehow pass out halfway through, I'll definitely I'll definitely do that. But everybody <laughs> who bad. wants to uh, who wants who wants to go to an Australian Skeptics Conference and you've never been to a conference, yeah. or if you're a conference fanatic and you just you know you've been trying to figure out because I've been wanting to go yeah. to QED, I wanted to go to Nexus, but I could only get the online thing. But it's fine; like it's still lots of fun. I met a bunch of new people. Uh, we had little chat rooms mm. and stuff like that. It was great fun. So. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that, and I'll put a description so anybody who's interested in joining in can go in and get some get their access sorted. 
And we'll see you at Skepticon. Thank you so much for joining me, Richard. This was really nice. Not a problem. And if people want to hear the, the Skeptic Zone every week, just go to skepticzone.tv and you can see what's on the show and uh, hopefully join us. Absolutely. And I'll put that link as well down there. And I have to, I mean, I, have, I, I was a little late to catch up on the Skeptic Zone, but I am loving every episode I'm listening to. So thank you so much for the work you do, for the support you give to skeptics around the world and, and myself included. And, you know, stay strong and keep going. And if there's anything I can do to help, you just let me know. And I'm sure we'll Thanks, get Abhijit. again very soon. I can't wait to come over soon. Who knows? Soon, I hope. And uh, yeah. enjoy New Delhi once again. Absolutely. I'll have some butter chicken and naan waiting for you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Talk to you soon, Richard. Bye. Bye.